We are now coming to the final uh, speaker of the day, that is uh, Ms. Urbasi Sinha, Professor Urbasi Sinha. Uh, the topic is Photonic Quantum Science and Technology. Uh, let me introduce Urbasi to you. So, uh, Professor Urbasi Sinha is from the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. She is heading the Quantum Information and Computing Laboratory at RRI. She is an associate faculty member at the Institute of Quantum Computing, Canada, and Center for Quantum Information and Quantum Control, University of Toronto. She completed her PhD at Cambridge on experiments in high temperature superconductivity, and her MSc in Physics, Natural Sciences, Trop Tripos, also from K Cambridge. Professor Sinha has been awarded several extramural grants from national agencies in India like the Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Electronics and Telecom Information Technology, Government of India, and ISRO, as well as international agencies like the John Templeton Foundation, and as well as India Trento Program for Advanced Research. She's making a difference in the category. She won uh, the Astrocham Women in Cyber, making a difference in the category Cyber Leading from the Front in 2021. Recently, she's been awarded the prestigious 26th Chandrasekhar Saraswati National Eminence Award for the year 2023 in the domain of science, technology, as well as the Canada Ex Excellence Research Chair in Photonic Quantum Science and Technologies by the Government of Canada. So with that, I welcome Ms. Urbasi. Um, so I would like to thank Professor Mishra, Shurjo, and Sushila, and others for inviting me. Um, if we are ready, then I can tell you about photonic quantum science and technologies. So um, this is a very different topic from what I've been hearing for most of the afternoon. So there was a lot of biology focus in the talks that I heard. Uh, so we are going to go back a little bit uh, away from biology, uh, a bit towards more of physics and uh, mathematics, computer science, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's not a topic that is very uh, usually covered in um, you know, most of our uh, curricula, so I will probably uh, you know, keep it at a very general level uh, so that you know, at least some, uh, you know, I can leave you with some uh, message, right? So uh, this is how we began in 2012 with the inauguration of the lab, and we were very lucky. So for anyone who here already knows a little bit about quantum, you will probably know about quantum key distribution and the most famous protocol was the BB84 protocol. So Bennett and Brassard came up with this protocol and so we had Brassard also with us in this inauguration. So we started off on a very nice note uh, with important people in the field uh, encouraging us in 2012. So having said that, I think um, this is a quote which of course I like uh, because you know it was by Richard Feynman. You may know that he was a very well-known, he is a very well-known uh, physicist. He's not alive anymore, but his legacy stays on. So he's a Nobel laureate in physics. And he very famously said that he thinks he can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics, right? And so this was in 1965. And in 2024, we would say that, you know, uh, some of it still remains true. Nobody perhaps completely understands quantum mechanics. And that is probably the reason why we still manage to thrive and use these you know, this phenomena which make it a little bit counterintuitive to our advantage for various things that we are doing in quantum science and technology. So I think the mysteries and magic of quantum mechanics make it uh, very relevant uh, for us now and in future. So having said that, as I said, that, you know, I'll keep it at a general level. So what I will do is I will tell you a little bit about what is quantum, why it is interesting, what are the technologies which excite us these days, and of course, what we are doing uh, at Raman Research Institute on these topics, and, but then not go into details uh, as such, okay? So having said that, you know, if you feel that quantum is something which you hear about a lot these days, it's true, it's become a bit of a buzzword, you hear a lot about quantum computing, quantum communication, all this comes out even in popular media, but then it has been something around us for a long, long time, and it has had an impact on our daily lives from much before this current, uh, you know, uh, fascination, new fascination with the subject. So if you see on the screen, I don't think uh, we have a pointer, but I don't know if you can see my mouse, then you can see this is an MRI machine, right? And so an MRI machine is something which is, we take it for granted these days. And, and so this is something based on quantum mechanics, for instance. So 
whether it's a laser. And so, you know, many of us are wearing glasses here, so if you want to get your eyes corrected, we do laser eye surgery. So these are all things which have become very commonplace. But these are all based on, of course, fundamental quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is more than 100 years old. And so it is not a new subject by any stretch of the imagination. And the applications are also very, very widespread, um, uh, you know, uh, in our daily lives. So having said that, uh, because we have some young people in the audience and uh, also some people who are not from quantum, let's say, it is important for us to, you know, uh, rem remind ourselves that this is a subject which is not only interesting because of its applications, but also because of its very rich history and legacies. So I don't, I mean, you know, just like uh, Professor Balaram went through a lot of a very nice historical, uh, you know, perspectives on biology, but with a focus on women in biology. But then I will not talk about just women in quantum and Nobel Prize because we've not quite had one as of now. So, you know, that would be a very sad uh, talk to give, but then I will definitely tell you about why quantum is interesting from a historical perspective. Uh, in fact, uh, it probably is right to say that in the physical sciences domain, quantum may be the field which has received maximum number of Nobel Prizes consistently. You know, so it has received it for various seminal contributions that these great people have made. I won't go through the details of these contributions, but then, you know, for physicists, it's a revision. Thanks, Shurjo, for actually showing up for the talk. Uh, he didn't even hear me. Thank you for showing up. Yeah, so, uh, and then of course, you know, these are all uh, great people in quantum, Dirac, Heisenberg, Max Born, and uh, as you can see, it's not spaced out. So every decade we have had uh, Nobel Prize winning work in quantum, including let's say 2022, which was, you know, just last to last year's Nobel Prize. And this is a Nobel Prize which was given to three gentlemen, uh, Alan Aspe, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger. And as you can see, this is for experiments with entangled photons establishing violation of what are called Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. So this may be something you're not particularly familiar with, at least some of you. But then if you are really interested in the modern Nobel Prize in quantum, you can have a look at this article that I was invited to write, where I really spent a lot of time and energy in giving details of why this is a beautiful prize. But then it is actually a beautiful prize even if you're not from quantum, because you know it is for contributions that have happened spanned decades. It's not just one thing which is very impactful and it got the Nobel Prize. So for instance, uh, John Clauser started these experiments, Alan Aspe continued over decades with these experiments, and so did Anton Zeilinger. So it is actually an ode to what we sometimes forget uh, in, you know, in India or otherwise, you know, funding agencies, they expect you to produce results a uh, day before yesterday. I mean, and, and you know, so, so scientists in the audience will know this agony that, you know, you're supposed to have done everything already, right? But then having said that, this is an ode to uh, decades of work. So sometimes some things really take that long to, you know, full, fully, uh, foolproof, uh, you know, establish. And so this prize was beautiful even in that sense because it gave um, some testimony to this uh, legacy of these three gentlemen. So having said that, um, because, you know, as a, again, you know, appealing to the people who are not from this field, quantum is not something which comes intuitively to you. Uh, it's, in fact, it is uh, qu quite uh, counterintuitive. So just wanted to bring forth one or two concepts which we do come across a lot in our applications in a little bit of a, a um, you know, general sense without getting into details. So first one is quantum superposition. Now this one I think will appeal to most of you here because I see that half the audience is really busy with their cell phones. And they are just here because they want to give me some respect as the last speaker. Uh, and one was settling accounts downstairs and has come up because I wrote him a WhatsApp message. So I do believe a lot of this audience really wants to be somewhere else. It's a Saturday evening almost, right? And we are here in a part of the city and we really have to go to some other part of the city, many of us, right? So I really know that you want to leave this. So you want to be at home, whereas you're also here. So now if you were a quantum particle, actually that would be possible. You could be a little bit here and a little bit there at the same time, and this is quantum superposition. So it's alpha zero plus beta one, a little bit of zero and a little bit of one. Unfortunately, we are not quantum particles. We are all here, uh, whether we like it or not, and my daughter is at home. So these are very definite positions that we have taken because of you know classicality, right? But then quantum superposition is what gives you the power of quantum computing. It's like a light switch, which is a little bit off and a little bit on at the same time. 
And so this obviously sounds counterintuitive, but it is true. And I won't get into the details of that because that will take us away from the general nature that this talk is sort of supposed to have. But this is one of those concepts which is counterintuitive, but is the reason for the quantum computer being what it is supposed to be. Very powerful, right? The second concept, I think, does appeal to a large section of the audience here, which seems to be, you know, a little bit over 30, right? And so if you are a little bit over 30 or, you know, uh, more than a little bit over 30, then you would realize that this is from this very interesting movie called Mela, which happened a few decades back. And why am I, you know, popularizing a Bollywood film? That wasn't the intention. So you can see here this gentleman, Feroz Khan, who appears in two avatars in this movie, right? So one is, so what is, what am I saying here? So this is one of those genre of movies, which was very popular in the 70s, 80s, even 90s, let's say, where we had these two, you know, twins who would be separated from each other at Kum Mela, right? So Kum Mela is this very interesting religious um, uh, function that we have uh, every now and then, yeah? And so I think you know this as Indians. So, and that is where we have a lot of casualties also and so on and so forth, but I won't give away my, uh, affiliations here. Yeah? So, but in Kumbh Mela, what happened in these movies is that these two twins, they would be separated. And so one of them would grow up to be a gangster, typically, and the other would naturally be a police officer because, you know, otherwise the movie won't really sustain. And so in the end, you know, in some of these movies, they would come together and they would fight for this common cause, which usually is their mother, right? I mean, so somehow this theme has been there in many movies. Now, entanglement is like that. Okay, so quantum entanglement is about a pair or more of particles which have been created at the same time and which could be separated from each other by thousands of kilometers, but they still share a quantum correlation which otherwise cannot be explained classically. And this quantum correlation is used for giving me hack-proof communication, for giving me quantum computing, quantum sensing, all these things which we will talk about a little bit as we go along. Uh, quantum entanglement is that. Of course, you know, it, it is a lot more than that, but this is just to give you a flavor for, a, for an analogy which may make a little more sense than all the math which I could, uh, which I want to avoid in this talk, right? So these are two examples which you should keep in mind because these are very important for everything that we discuss. So having said that, you know, quantum, so what have I proven in the last seven or eight minutes is that quantum has been around. It is 100 years old, let's say, it has already done a lot. So why are we so excited today, right? I mean, you know, why is this, there's this renewed excitement on quantum technologies? Uh, because we can now do so much more and dream much bigger. So now I will appeal to uh, Sushila and, and uh, you know, ask her a question, if you don't mind. Because, you know, I have grown to know you over the last two hours, right? So then maybe I can ask you a question already. So uh, do you have children? You don't. Then I will ask Shurjo, who definitely has one, right? And so you have children. So do you earn any money? I mean, of course, as a professor, a little bit, right? And so you have some money in the bank. Do you think it will go to the, the child of yours? When you die, I mean, no, no, no. Uh, in, in a gory situation, several decades down the line, then you if something is left here, so Shujo, of course, is our accounts person. He was missing my talk, settling accounts downstairs. So he knows his money. So I think he will leave some for his progeny. And if he does, he believes that it'll, it'll be left. Now, of course, the answer to, I mean, you know, if I ask these questions, you should have said no, because, you know, otherwise there's no fun in asking such a question. So the problem is that it may not be true. Should Joe's money, however little it may be, as a fellow academic, you know, we earn a lot, right? So whatever little is left may not be left for his son, if I remember correctly. Daughter, okay, so my daughter, so we have both daughters, okay. So they may not get this, and so what is the reason for this, okay? So this brings us to the first application which I want to highlight in quantum. And so having said that, this is me uh, receiving this last uh, award that was very nicely, I mean, you know, I, I was going to come up and say, let's skip those details, let's prevent the people from walking out of the room uh, when they were reading out those little things that I have achieved. But this was this um, National Eminence Award in Science and Technology, which I got in December last year. And it apparently came with some small amount of resources and so on and so forth. So having said that, this is my daughter, okay, uh, on a good day. And of course, you know, the problem with my daughter is that both her parents are actually physicists, right? And so it's a very lonely sort of life and a boring sort of situation because even at dinner time we talk about, you know, error bars and, and, and things like that. So it's, uh, that is how she's growing up beautifully. 
right? And so, however, one of the things which keeps coming up is that, you know, nothing is going to remain secure, really, because the current means of security are not sufficient. And so, at least for her, it is quite clear that she may not inherit anything unless her mother steps into the way and comes up with a solution, which is what her mother seems to be doing a lot. And this is the first application I wanted to highlight, that whatever, you know, you think is secure right now may not be so because of the way the current security is based. So now, of course, I give my ode to the fact that we are celebrating International Women's Day, and I have a gender bias slide, okay? And, and this is a gender bias situation, and I, I think, you know, now in this audience, I would say barring one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven people, you know, those seven people do this very well, right? This particular situation where you just come and dump everything on the ground or on the bed or wherever it is that you feel is a good idea. This, I think, these seven people perhaps, including our, I think you will stop taking the video after this, but then, you know, these people, I think, are good at this, right? And then the rest of the audience here is sometimes forced to be good at this, and sometimes maybe because we are the superior gender, it is just naturally we are good at things, right? And so this is a situation that is quite common in our household. And there is a gender bias in this situation, but there is more to it, obviously, right? What is the more thing? The left side, as I just explained, these seven people, they, they're not the superior gender. So it's obviously an easy problem. So the left side is an easy problem. Sorry, you are excluded. The front row is excluded. Okay, and, and then the right side is a hard problem. Because, so what do I mean by easy problem and hard problem? An easy problem takes less time. A hard problem takes more time. But then if you think about it, this is an example of an everyday problem that is not equally hard both ways. You can go from left to right. Obviously, just take it out and iron and do that. From right to left also you can do much more easily. So these are like reverse problems, but not reverse in hardness. And this is what our current security is based on. Hardness of mathematical problems. Okay, and so now again, now Shoot Joe is listening to me. So again, I'll ask him a question because he's from the IISC, right? You should know some math, yeah? So, okay, so what is three times seven? Thank God. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I actually have to say that, you know, if you didn't say that, then my husband, who's also at IISC back home, you know, he, uh, so thank, thanks to you, you know, IISC name is saved, right? So three times seven is 21, okay? It's good, it's a great math, piece of math. Now. What are the two prime factors of 112371? He says, oh my God. So he's right, of course. You know, it's not just because he's from IISC or because he's the wrong gender. It's just that it's a hard problem. But then three times seven is multiplication. And 112371, you know, if you want to find the prime factors, that is factorization. These are the reverse problems. Of course, the two prime factors, if you multiply, you get the number, but they are not equally hard problems. Factorization is a much harder problem than multiplication. So this is what most of our current security is based on, the RSA protocol, blah, blah, blah. These are all based on mathematical hardness of problems. So now, computational resources, they grow very fast. And today's hard problem could be solved tomorrow using brute force attack. So you see, quantum computing is coming up. A quantum computer can actually solve the factorization problem. And similarly, you can have a classical algorithm also. Uh, because there is no theorem which tells you that something remains hard forever. There is no mathematical basis for it. It's just that we haven't been able to come up with an algorithm to crack the factorization in an easy way. And so this is something which is very dubious to base your security on, the mathematical hardness of a problem. But that's what we do. And so my security should be independent of future advancements in computational power, new algorithms, or new technology. It should be future secure. I should not base it on things like this. And that is where we have the first quantum application which I wanted to highlight, which is quantum communications. So quantum communications is actually a paradigm change in security where we have ditched the idea of basing it on mathematical hardness, and we are saying that, you know, we are actually basing it on laws of nature, or laws of quantum physics for that matter, uh, and not on mathematical hardness. And so we have changed the paradigm, and that is, in fact, one of the things our lab is working on a lot, which we will tell you a little bit as we go along. And so this is, uh, 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 you know, a catastrophe which could have happened in the future, when Shuju and my money, not so much, but then we had a lavish wedding a few days ago, those people would be more worried, right? Uh, uh, the Jamnagar wedding and so on. So there are people who really want that inheritance to work, right? Because they, they are not academics. And so then that is something which we can avoid 
by changing the paradigm, which is what we are doing now. So catastrophe seems to be a good uh, topic, so I'll go on to one more, which is this. And I definitely seem to like uh, examples of you know, children and uh, what they feel, because I put my daughter's picture in the first one, looks like, and this is not my daughter. This is somebody um, very talented who has done this illustration, and it's not me. But then this is, this is what? This is a world in which you can see a little girl is holding a teddy bear and not very happy because she is surrounded by an environment where you know, there's hardly a tree, all the fish are dead in the ocean, right? And, and it's a very bleak scenario as, as it's very beautifully captured in this picture. So this, is, this could be a future world if we don't take action now. Because you see, why are we going to go towards this world? Because you know, we have all this industrialization, we are doing very well, right? Having said that, we are also putting a lot of pollutants in the atmosphere, put pollutants in the water bodies, and if we don't take much action now, then this is what we would be looking at, or if we live, to look at that. So this is really an end of the world scenario that we have depicted in this picture. And this is, could become real, right? And so of course, why am I saying all this? Because you already know all this. I'm saying that we could have a possible solution in quantum, even in this problem. Okay, and so what is that solution that is quantum computing? Now, you hear about quantum computing, you hear about its ability to compute very fast. But, you know, that is not quite right. So a quantum computer is a device which can actually compute a certain class of problems much faster than their classical counterparts. But one of those classes of problems is what is called quantum simulation or, you know, quantum chemistry. So I can simulate new molecules using the quantum computer. So once I simulate these new molecules and if I can make them, because you see, I can go down to the atomic level, subatomic level at a quantum computer. So I can simulate things which otherwise would be impossible using a classical device. Once I do this simulation, if I make this material, there's a lot of active research going on on making materials which actively capture carbon from the atmosphere or, you know, the pollutants from the water bodies, this is actually happening. And so, you know, this, this is one of those use cases of quantum computing which perhaps is not as well highlighted as, let's say, it'll break my security, because it's not something in its favor that it's going to break my security, but this definitely is worthwhile. So we can prevent things like this, for instance, by using a quantum computer correctly. Likewise, we have another example, and this is about you know, oil and natural gas. This is India. These are the various regions where you have you know, oil, uh, reserves in India. So what can we do? What are the things we may want to do from the oil and natural gas industry? We may want to detect new oil reserves, right? We may want to detect and locate gas leaks because these are important problems. So of course we are doing that already, but then imagine doing that with much more precision than what is possible now. So if I use the current sensors, I may not be able to sense uh, exactly where the oil reserve is, but by using a quantum sensor and for instance, you know, uh, this sort of a device which is already available, it's um, a gravimeter, okay? So by using gravity, I can actually detect things below the surface which otherwise would not be possible. And so this is an example of a quantum uh, technology which again is very useful. We can have a portable MRI device, for instance. So, you know, MRI is very expensive. I mean, I guess some of you may know this, right? And so if I actually can make that cheaper and portable, can you imagine the kind of revolution it will have in, for instance, the industries which the previous speakers were really uh, speaking of, which is healthcare, right? So this is sort of a snapshot of how quantum, why, so the, I'm answering that question which I presented a few slides ago, why this renewed excitement in quantum? This renewed excitement in quantum is because these technologies were not possible uh, a few years ago. And now they are, because we are able to actually control and manipulate things at a very uh, tiny level, okay? So, okay, so what are we doing in India about uh, quantum technologies? Well, we are doing a lot, actually. And this is our Honorable Prime Minister, who, of course, declared the National Quantum Mission last year. And so we are working on all these areas in quantum. So uh, this was declared last year. Currently, we are in the proposal phase. It will start this year. Uh, and we are told maybe on Independence Day, you know, uh, that will be nice. So we will start the national mission this year. So we will be making, uh, you know, high precision, uh, you know, sensors, materials, sources, detectors, uh, then of course, quantum computers with large number of qubits. Then we will be doing quantum communications over long distances that I will talk about because that is kind of a part of what I do. So I'll talk about a little bit more in detail. So the last three are in that domain. And then likewise, we will have, you know, these are the four areas. And so we already talked about three of them. The fourth one is obviously an overarching area. 
because you know it's material. So if you create new materials, you can have a better computer, better communication, better sensing. So it's kind of more uh, horizontal rather than a vertical, but that's also something we will do. And uh, we, will, we are looking at a lot of growth, a lot of innovation, and ho hopefully at the end of eight years, we become a leading nation in quantum science and technology. So that's the hope. And so in India, we are doing quite a bit about this. So now, for the last, uh, you know, so of course I have spent, uh, I think, 15 minutes already. And so the re re uh, rest of the talk will be on what we do. I mean, you know, so just to give you a flavor for why I'm actually telling you all this, you know, and not telling you about, you know, the beautiful um, healthcare applications because I, that would be very, uh, that I would be a misfit for talking about those things. Right? So why am I giving this talk is what I will uh, justify for the rest of the talk. And so I work with photons. Okay, and so photons, what are they? So they are single particles of light. And so now, you know, when you want to do something at a quantum level, then obviously you want to do this at a single particle level because that is where the, all these um, manifestations of entanglement or superposition, these things, they become real when you go down to that level. Otherwise, you know, quantum tunneling is an, another example. Again, I will pick on Shurjo, who's the one I know the best here. So if Shurjo were to really run and hit himself against the wall, I do believe he will come back only hurt and not really tunnel through the wall. So this is why it's not useful to talk about it at a macroscopic level, you want to go down to the single particle. So we work with single photons. But for those of you who know, photons don't have mass, they don't have charge. Uh, so a light particle does not have these things. So this is a nice cartoon I found on the internet. So along with antimatter and dark matter, we have recently discovered the existence of dozen matter, which appears to have no effect on the universe whatsoever. And so, you know, you may think without mass, without charge, maybe photons don't really matter. And of course, that's not true. They don't have matter, but they matter a lot. And that is the rest of the talk, okay? And so what do we do with them? So if you are interested in photons, for instance, and don't know much about them, which is uh, uh, highly likely, then do have a look at some of this. This is a popular article, whereas this is a textbook chapter, uh, which tells you details about how to make photons, how to use photons, and so on and so forth. If you're interested, I can send you a coffee, copy illegally, uh, because this, you have to buy this, but I can send you a soft copy if you uh, drop me an email, okay? So what do we do with photons? So we are the first lab in India, which, uh, you know, we are working on photonic quantum science and technologies. So we work on quantum computing, quantum communication, sensing, and, you know, fundamentals of the subject as well, okay? So we basically cover all ground. Uh, and, and our lab has this mantra, which is um, actually somebody did mention science, uh, today's science and tomorrow's technology in a previous talk as well. And so this is, of course, from the world war. I mean, you know, we don't want to get into the legacy per se, but that is what we do. We work a lot on the fundamental science and the applied technologies. So we, we have a marriage between these two in the lab. Okay. And so uh, in quantum communications, we are looking at all those things that you saw in the national mission document, quantum key distribution, relay repeaters, randomness, chip-based quantum communications, because you know sometimes you need things to be portable. Uh, in computing, we have our own photonic platform. Okay. The other thing which may be of interest here to people who are not from this field is that you know, there's something called an Open Quantum Institute, which has been recently uh, you know, established at CERN. And so I am in the advisory board for them. And so what we are doing is we are coming up with use cases for quantum computing, which would help in solving some of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. That includes health, that includes poverty, food, so on and so forth. So I'm actually looking at the health. Uh, so finally, I have some healthy thing that I'm doing uh, with an ode to the previous two speakers, uh, but then only by using quantum towards trying to see if I can benefit this sector. I don't uh, really work directly in it, but this is something we do. Uh, sensing, we are doing many things, and of course, fundamental aspects, right, as I mentioned. So this is a snapshot of the lab. And these are, of course, the people who make the lab happen. I mean, you know, I mean, of course, on a given day, I'm doing this activity a lot more than actually working in the lab nowadays looks like. But then it's because of them that we have things to discuss, right? So, and I'll skip that. And we also work with people from outside India because we believe that, you know, it's only through collaborations that we can really enrich what we are doing rather than being in silos. So we have a lot of those both within and outside. So bird's eye view of our science, and this is a video which usually works and it is working today. Okay, so uh, the technology which we are using in the lab is what is called nonlinear optics. So here you can see this is a crystal. It has a very high nonlinear coefficient and you can see a strong blue beam which is incident on it. And this gives rise to a pair of photons, okay? So one in 10 to the eight or 10 will convert to a pair of photons which will come out in the form of a cone. And because it's a cross section, I see the ring there. 
And so now if I stop the video, and you know, this point here, this intersection point, it could belong to the left cone or the right cone. And that is the entangled point. Because entanglement is about indistinguishability. You should not know which one is H and which one is V in polarization basis. So those are the entangled photons. And so if I want to work with entangled photons, I work with that area of the cone. If I want to work with non-entangled but correlated photons, then it's the rest of the cone and so on and so forth. So this is just to give you an example of how things actually look. Of course, this is on a very highly intense camera. You can't really see photons uh, per se. because uh, And so these are different examples of you know, how entanglement manifests itself in the lab. And uh, having said that, I think uh, you know, this is just to give, uh, give you a little lab tour without going to the lab. The lab is one and a half hours away. I just timed it uh, today morning. But then if you are interested, we are happy to welcome you still. Right? Uh, and so this is, you know, you, you go through a bunch of optics, optomechanics, which gives rise to a, a lot of features which I'm skipping for now. That is the nonlinear crystal, by the way, that square thing that you see in the middle. That is your crystal. And so, I have, you know, the strong light is incident on it. And then, of course, you don't see the photons because you shouldn't. And once the photons come out, they hit what is called a beam splitter, which essentially is that. It splits into two. So this, um, you know, uh, I think many angles. Uh, so some student has obviously spent, uh, this is the beam splitter, okay? So that uh, square thing that you see there, the square cube is a beam splitter. So one photon goes uh, forward, the other is reflected, okay? So if I have a pair of photons, then the next thing I do is, you know, I actually measure them together. So one is incident here, one is incident here. And just like my twins example, these guys, however, have been created at the same time. So if I actually have two photons incident at the same time on two detectors, I know they exist. Because, you know, they have been created at the same time. So this is an example of what is called a coincidence peak. And this is what we measure to know uh, that, you know, we call them a heralded source. What is heralding? I measure one, I know the presence of the other. I herald the presence of the other. So that is how we create the photons in the lab. And this is some other examples. These are, and, and our previous speaker talked about how academics become very happy when things are published. Uh, and so we are very happy. Uh, we are academics, so we become happy when things are published. So these are some of our recent results. Having said that, I wanted to highlight two, two things because, you know, we do a lot of things. And if I want to say everything, then you won't really have any concrete thing to go back home with. And of course, you will go home after this, so you should go back home with something. So one of the examples I wanted to pick up is, again, a work related to this one. So we already highlighted the Nobel Prize. So this particular thing, which is called these Bell inequality violations or whatever, why did Anton Zeilinger win the prize? Because he actually performed it in what is called a loophole-free way. Okay. So now we have a diverse audience here. Is there anyone from the legal sector? Is there a lawyer or an advocate or a... Uh, I don't know. So, so I don't think there is anyone there. So then again, I will go back to Shurjo. <laughs> who, you know, could become one. You know, you really have the characteristics. You, you really uh, are very convincing. So that's how I managed to c come here, right? Shurjo is very convincing. So now comes the point. Shurjo and I are in a courtroom, and he is defending a case, and I am the opponent, okay? So who will win is the question. Of course, the answer is obvious, yeah? But then having said that, it's not, be I will not win just because, you know, of International Women's Day, right? How do we actually win a case in a court? So what will I do? I will find a set of arguments. He will find a fault in my argument and say something against that. This fault is a loophole. I'm making a set of arguments which is not perfect. There is something he can catch and uh, prevent my argument from going through. So that's the loophole. Then again, I will catch a loophole in what he is saying. Till we go on catching each other's loopholes, we are not going to win this case. Ultimately, one of us is going to be loophole free, me. Right? And so once I'm loophole free, then he has nothing to say, and then the case is open and shut. Right? And so this is how you win a case, and that is why a loophole is uh, an important legal term, and having a loophole free argument is very important. And that is what Anton Zeilinger did. He performed the first loophole free, he and his students and team members, right, performed the first loophole free experiment for the violation of Bell inequalities. And why is that interesting? Not because, you know, it's obviously interesting. And this is something any student should read, irrespective of whether you like physics or not. Because this is a beautiful article which really tells you why loophole free is ne necessary. So it's not just because, you know, once you have a loophole free test, you can prove the underlying theory is correct, which is quantum mechanics in this case. But it's because once you have a loophole free test, you can use this for the last two lines, which is perfectly secure communication and unhackable random numbers. 
And so the entire field of quantum security is sacrosanct now because of the loophole-free violation of Bell inequalities. Till then, there was always a possibility that an eavesdropper is going to come and use that loophole to know your secret. Now eavesdropper cannot do that. And so loophole-free is a big deal. And, and, and so have a look at this article if you want to know more about it. But this is how it is related, you know, even in quantum. And so what did we do? We actually performed the first loophole-free test of what is called macrorealism. So we talked about Bell inequalities. I won't get into details of that. But what that involves is, let's say, two particles which are separated from each other in space. And then, you know, you have to be outside what is called each other's light cone. And this is something the physics people will know. So you cannot send information to one another. Otherwise, you know, you're not uh, doing the right test because, you know, you can always bias one another. Then there's a loophole. So you have to really be that far apart so that you can close what is called the locality loophole. Okay? And so this was done by Anton Zeilinger. Now comes the point that if you have a single particle, you can't spread it into, I mean, just like I said, well, all of us may want to be in two places at the same time. A single particle will not be physically in two locations at the same time by 200, 300 meters or whatever, right? So then what, how do you prove, uh, you know, the underlying theory for a single particle? And so that is what is called the leggett garg inequality. Okay, so this is Sir Anthony Leggett, Nobel laureate in physics, and his then postdoc, now um, rather senior faculty, Anupam Garg. And so they came up with the leggett garg inequality, which is the time equivalent of the Bell inequality. So a single particle cannot be in two places like that, but it can evolve in time. So I can measure correlations in time. And so several decades people have been measuring uh, the leggett garg inequality, violating it, and so on and so forth. So ours is the first loophole-free violation of the leggett garg inequality, which we achieved in early 2022, 2022 being the year when in October the Nobel Prize was given to the loophole-free violation of Bell. So it became uh, very poignant for us that we did this this year. And this has the same ramification, so now already being used in security as well. So now we have a different paradigm for security through this experiment that we have done. So this we wanted to highlight because, you know, it m sort of appeals to something earlier, and that is Tony Leggett, by the way, whose 80th birthday we celebrated a few years ago at RRI. And so uh, that was us. So, uh, and then, you know, the, this is also nice, this New Scientist article, they did call us the most watertight experiment of all time. So, of course, you know, the whole point that Shurjo said is that I should Im apparently, um, you know, inspire young people towards doing what I do. So, you know, so we are, we are doing all right, and so you should feel inspired a little bit to do what we do. And so this was uh, put for that purpose because of Shurjo again, who has come up in this talk seven times already. Thanks to the fact that I only know two names on first basis, uh, in a first name basis. So, okay, so this is the first one. Second one I want to highlight is quantum communication, of course, because, you know, I've been telling you a lot about that. It is the most practical quantum technology because it's very much available. There are also companies which are making products, for QKD and so on and so forth. And so we know why we should worry that we already went through because the current paradigm of mathematical hardness is an issue. And so uh, we will skip that. And go so these are the various ways in which you do cryptography. And so you might know of the Enigma machine and all that because that was a very popular one for the World War purposes. And so these are all, this is very old. Cryptography is an old topic, right? But this has a problem because it's based on mathematical hardness. And so we, this is Peter Shore who created the problem. Uh, because he came up with Shor's algorithm, which can break the factorization problem, okay? And so that is why we need to come up with a change. And uh, this is what we have just gone through earlier. And so I will skip that. And so quantum key distribution is what we need to do. I will skip the laws of nature per se, because, you know, that might go into a little too much detail. But there are very fundamental laws of quantum physics which we are using for keeping this data secure. And, um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of information for people who are interested. You can have a look at these, you know, references that are there on these uh, pages uh, for more information, right? And eavesdrop, so basically an eavesdropper uh, will not be able to, so one of the things which you should know is that in quantum mechanics, if you measure something, you destroy it, right? So you basically collapse the wave function, we call it. So if an eavesdropper tries to just do something just like that, we will know she's there. That is what we are using as the basis. But of course, using lots of laws, which I'm skipping for now. Okay, and this is the status. There is a lot of activity, suffices to say. However, so what that brings us to the national mission and the fact that we want to do long distance quantum communication. So I really want to know the names of the three beautiful ladies in the second row, but I don't know your names, so I will uh, not name you, but the person in middle 
with the beautiful Bindi, right? So suppose you and I, I mean, I'll, I'll skip Shurjo for a moment, you know. So, yeah. so, okay, so now, you know, suppose you and I want to communicate with each other using quantum communication. It's not very interesting because we are in this open hall and there's no secret about what I'm saying. But suppose we have a secret and we want to share it with each other. Just doing it in this room uh, is not very interesting because you know the whole point of security is you want to keep banking data secure you want to keep your password information secure and things like that so the security makes sense when you're doing this over a long distance because otherwise it's just a proof of principle within a lab my student and i or um, this beautiful lady and i that's not how it should work right so we want to increase the distance so that you know we can communicate over thousands of kilometers, that's the idea. So India wants to send some secret information to Australia, let's say. How will it do that if you don't know how to do it over a long distance? Then a natural question should come to your mind that, you know, we have all been abroad, uh, at least many of us, right, and we've called home. How are we doing that? We are communicating over long distances using the device that now less people are looking at, uh, which is nice, thank you very much. So, so now, you know, you're, you are using classical communication, right? So you're using that all the time. So that is, let's say, fiber-based. You know, we have this ACT cable which comes to our houses and so on and uh, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But then this is fiber network is very popular. So why am I making such a big deal about long distance? We already know the solution to the problem. Of course we don't, otherwise I wouldn't make a big deal. So the problem is that if you want to do free space communication without a fiber, again looking at Shurjo, he's walking away from me, walking away from me. Beyond a point I won't see him. Why is that? Because, of course, I'm wearing glasses, but also because the Earth is round. So beyond a point, I cannot see something because of the horizon issue. So that is like two, three hundred kilometers. I cannot have line of sight beyond that distance. So free space, we have to limit to that distance. Now fiber. I can always have long, long fiber. But what do we do in a usual fiber network is, a fiber, as for people who may know, it has losses, right? If you try to send something through a fiber, it will uh, have a loss. So beyond a point, the signal will drop, as we call it. So signal uh, drop, we say in Bengal, where signals drop a lot. And so when the signal drops, what do we do? We kind of go outside to the balcony and try to get some, uh, we wave around. We do a lot of that when we go to some remote areas sometimes, trying to get signal. But then, of course, uh, what do we do in a fiber scenario? We just put a booster or a repeater. This is something we may have heard of, that you put something which boosts up the signal, then again it goes on. But you can't repeat a quantum signal because of no cloning theorem. You cannot copy an unknown quantum state. So you cannot use this classical scenario in a fiber situation. So you have a problem. Free space, certain distance, fiber also certain distance. So what do you do? You do one of these three things which I have highlighted here. And so the, la the first one has some issues. We will skip the first one. The second and third and fourth are the most interesting, where you know you come up with a quantum version of the repeater, which does not have the no cloning issue. And that's a very hard problem. It's a very R&D problem. And we are looking at that uh, as a lab and under the mission. And the other is to use a satellite. And so this is very interesting. So if you want to, if you're interested, then have a look at some of these articles, which I was almost forced to write after the National Quantum Mission was launched. But I'm happy that to have done that uh, because, you know, it just makes it um, a little more accessible, let's say, than otherwise. So what is satellite-based quantum communication? So in fact, we are working on India's first project on satellite-based QKD. So the idea is that you can see the satellite. It's sitting on top of a ground station. Then it's going to move and then it is going to come on top of some other ground station. That ground station could be in a location which I don't see. Because the satellite is seeing it, right? It's moving around. And so by doing that, the satellite is acting as a trusted node, which makes me connected with a location which otherwise I don't see, or I can't just lay a fiber cable. So it can go thousands of kilometers. So this is called satellite-based quantum communication, one of our focus projects in RRI. Likewise, we are working on chip-based QKD. We are working on quantum teleportation. Again, you know, something I can discuss offline because it's one of those things which is much misunderstood. So it's not just like the, you know, the, the science fiction. Uh, so some of us will remember Star Trek and so on. So we had this beam me up Scotty. And so the whole person used to be teleported from one place to the other. So all you can do is teleport a property. So, I mean, you know, again, taking the example of my new friend here. So, you know, she's there, I'm here, but her bindi is teleported to me. 
whereas I remain where I am, she remains where she is. This is teleportation. It's not like she will disappear and I will become her. So, I mean, so there is a bit of an issue there, but we are doing the right thing. And if you want, you can come and see in the lab. Likewise, we are doing a lot of interesting random number generation, which as you know is important for weather forecasting, for stock market. So you, the whole basis is randomness. So we have a new way of doing randomness, which is more random than the previous random numbers. And this is something under patent and so on and so forth. So, but I won't tell you so much detail. Uh, so just to highlight one project, which I mentioned I wanted to do, which is uh, in fact, uh, you know, the first project on satellite QKD. So this is the general idea. We will establish quantum communication between two Indian ground stations using an Indian satellite as a trusted node. As a later step, we will also have a, a connection with Canada. So Canada is like thousands of kilometers away, right? And so that would be a global ne network scenario, which is what we are looking at. Okay. And so why is this experiment exceptional? Well, again, an ode to today, it is exceptional. It is being led by a uh, right gendered person, but that cannot be the answer, the, the science answer to this question. This is actually India's first project on satellite QKD. And when we first proposed this, uh, people actually asked questions like, you know, are you really sure a photon can be detected or what is a detector? So there was a lot of ignorance, uh, you know, in the people who matter and, and, and who gave us the funding and all. Then China launched uh, the first quantum satellite in 2016, uh, Mishius. And then we were asked the question, how come we are not doing such a project in India? How come we have not already finished doing the project which we were never funded for and so on? And so then we got the funding uh, within a few months. And so it is exceptional because, you know, it kind of started in adversity, but then it has done a lot of things systematically, which we believe has played a small but significant role in making this whole quantum technology accessible and also real for people such that we now have a national mission even. So people, you know, there are of course others who have done other things in other technologies, but together we form a small group who we would say that, you know, through whatever successes we have had, we have managed to convince the powers to be that we need more resources now because it's not science fiction really, right? And so this is uh, what it is, so, and it is of course for security. Just to give you an example, these are again papers, right? Uh, so these are from the Chinese uh, mission. And so these are beautiful things. So what have they done? They have taken an entangled source, they have put it in a satellite, okay? And then they have sent the two photons to two ground stations. That is called downlink, literally, because the photons are going down. But at a certain height, uh, you know, you can't go beyond a certain distance because of solid angle. You can't just arbitrarily go to some distance. So you have a re restriction. Second problem is that the photon source has flown away. So imagine spending so much time and energy on that quantum resource and it has flown away. Suppose something goes wrong. You can't just, it's not a kite. So you can't just pull back a satellite and you know, fix it and send it back again. It's gone, right? So uh, downlink QKD has limitations. So obviously when we started, we wanted to do something which hasn't been done before and is hard naturally. Otherwise, why would you do something, right? I mean, of course, it's just your career. So you just do something hard which hasn't been done before and Put, put it at stake, sort of, and so that's what we're doing, uplink UKD, and so I won't go through the physics parts, but then the point is that the source is with me. Tomorrow, my good friend Shurjo comes up with a better source. I can replace it, but suppose it has flown away, we can't do that. So there is a lot of flexibility on ground, which is not there in the satellite, which we can use for very interesting science and technology, which is what we are aiming to do. And so what are the things, so these are the various things which you need to do. I will skip the details because I see that, you know, I don't think uh, you are familiar with this topic. So these are the things needed to do satellite QKD. All I want to say is that we have finished all the ground-based milestones right now. Currently, we are doing the oranges, which is, you know, the in-between ground and space. And then we are going to do the space-based milestones under the national mission. So that is the scope of Quest. Okay, and so we have achieved the first ever quantum key distribution experiment from India. And not only that, uh, this also had better results than the previous ones from NASA, which you know is an interesting organization, important organization. We were very pleased to start off this way, uh, having beaten an important record. Then we went on to show quantum communication between buildings. Because, you know, if I want to talk to a satellite, I can't just do things inside the lab and then talk to a satellite. There are many things I have to solve uh, because of free space. So we did that for the first time again uh, in 21, early 21. And then early last year, we did something very important. And I think somebody was mentioning something on this about pointing. So, you know, when you are looking at a satellite, I mean, you can keep looking at it, but the satellite is moving away. So you have to keep pointing to it. You have to track it and acquire the data. 
That is called a patch system, pointing acquisition tracking. And that's a very hard problem because you need to also do quantum communication along with it. And this we solved early last year. And then we have done software development as well for this. And you know, many interesting problems we have solved because you know, atmosphere is an issue actually, although we can't live without it. But then just imagine if it was all vacuum, it will be very easy to send a photon. But the atmosphere means we just hit the atmosphere and it gets deflected. So many solutions we have found, which I will skip. So this is, a, um, you know, a, a, again, a, the second and last lab tour, where we are showing you free space quantum communication. The photon is there. It is coming out of this telescopic arrangement. Alice remains within, Alice and Bob are the two people who communicate in quantum. So Alice remains within the lab. The Bob photon travels across the campus towards a, a, a different lab, which is our lab again. And the Bob photon then, you know, so this is my student and he's very happily posing to show you that we have a certain distance. And then the Bob photon enters the second lab, goes through a bunch of optics. So this is what we call the Bob measurement station. I won't tell you what we measure because that's a bit too much detail. But this is how we do free space quantum uh, communications, okay? And so uh, having said that, um, last of your three or four slides, we don't do just quantum communication. We do photonic quantum computing. If you're interested, we can discuss more. But what is very important about this slide is that this is a architecture which we have actually invented. So we actually definitely know a lot about it because there are too many people who are talking about quantum computers. So we want to do something which uh, you know, not everybody is doing because otherwise we are just repeating. If I want to build a thousand qubit quantum computer using superconducting qubits, IBM has already done it. So it will be a repetition exercise, but as a scientist, I would like to do something slightly different. So we are doing qubit based quantum computing. So you look engaged to me, the person. Yes. So I will ask you the last maths question. Okay. So what is two cubed? Yes. Excellent. So this audience has not failed me because sometimes people have thought I'm asking trick questions and then they don't answer, right? So two cubed is eight. So essentially three qubits, two cubed is actually three qubits. That gives you access to an eight dimensional space. Now what is three squared? Nine. So two qubits give you similar access. But you see, if I change the base from two to three to four, I can drop the exponent. So instead of a thousand qubit machine, I can aim for a much smaller number of a qubit machine. And that's what we are creating at RRI. So this is just an example. We are also working with commercial quantum computers. I already told you we are looking at the health sector, but here we have been looking at finding out how quantum is a quantum computer. Uh, and so we answered the question with this answer that it's not as quantum as you would want it to be. We need to improve. Okay. And these are fundamental tests of mecha quantum mechanics, quantum optics. I'll skip the details here. This is a, some, uh, an experiment where we are studying entanglement sudden death. Just wanted to highlight because, you know, again, the, my healthcare friends and the biology friends in the front row. Uh, so we are not looking at the actual, I mean, after this, you might just die out of boredom, but then that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at entanglement going to zero and then preventing it from happening. And so we can show you if you visit the lab. Um, skip this detail. We are also looking at quantum information and quantum gravity. So just to end with, you know, the fact, and this was the inspiration part, which I thought will be good for the, at least uh, half the audience. So uh, the work that we have done, we have been very blessed with receiving quite a lot of appreciation for it from various sectors, right? And so this is quantum com and these are the people who I care about. And so this is a popular media. This is industry. This is nature India. And finally, Government of India, which of course requires a special slide because Government of India is not known to always acknowledge uh, science and scientists, right? So they called us one of the 20 major success stories. We are very pleased. Likewise, you know, when we did the free space, we had vernacular as well, which was nice. I spoke in Hindi. Thankfully, it's my second language. And then in, uh, likewise for the moving receiver platform, again, we received some appreciation in quantum computing as well. Again, Nature India. So the last thing is, of course, going back to why we are here. Of course, you know, I mean, I've talked a lot about quantum technologies. I know it's a little too much, but I hope you gained something from it, right? At least I hope I managed to give the message that uh, it's not unexciting. Maybe biology is very exciting. And I was told uh, that you mentioned, right, that people are not finding male students entering biology. Uh, so maybe deflect some of the females to quantum. Uh, because we have an imbalance of the wrong kind there. So what is going to be my message to women who are already in STEM? Not the front row, obviously. They know what they're doing, but the younger guys, right? And uh, if you aspire to be, right? 
And so this is an example I wanted to take. This was an award that, again, was announced kindly, which was about women in cyber making a difference. Okay? And so I actually want to look forward to a future where, of course, you know, we don't need that. right? So we just have an award which says cyber making a difference. We just have two or three of such awards so that every gender is applicable. That is what we want. right? But then currently, we are not there yet because you know we really have a lot of disparity. So we are trying to bridge that by having some gender specific things, maybe in the favor of the superior gender right now. But then the world we want to look forward to, I'm sure all of us together, is where we don't need schemes like this. right? So I wanted to take an example. Of course, you know it has to be uh, an example which is not completely humanless. Right? And so this is a word which I'm sure we all know, right? Ambitious, it's an interesting adjective for someone. So now there are two, two sides here. One is ambitious could be driven, goal-oriented, right? And then ambitious could be someone who is difficult and attention-seeking. And now you can already see that the same person being ambitious would mean something else, depending on the gender. So if you are an, uh, a, a woman who is ambitious, then clearly you are in minority. So you're usually termed as difficult or she's really attention seeking and you know, uh, what is the point of all this? But if you are a male, then oh wow, this, this is a guy full of ambition. Let's support him. He's driven and goal oriented and all that, right? Same adjective, different meanings, which we have come across a lot, right? And so <laughs> same word can have two interpretations with conscious or unconscious gender bias. So my advice would be, of course, uh, which obviously probably is clear to you after this talk that just don't care about it, right? I mean, you know, so I'm very good at uh, not caring. Sorry, should you? So don't worry. Believe in yourself and your goals. Move ahead. But one thing is important that you should be honest. You should be sincere and determined, irrespective of gender, right? Because you know, if you forget that, if you say, okay, because I am female, uh, you know, I can do something unscrupulous to try, and then that's not good. Let's just not do that because I think. I mean, I mean, no, myself included, but there are important, very, you know, uh, luminary, uh, uh, you know, speakers before me. I think we've done something right. And so there is something that uh, definitely one can uh, aspire to be, uh, hopefully a quantum physicist at the end of the day. So with that, I thank you. Yeah. Anybody would like to ask Professor Udbasi any questions? Thank you for the interesting talk, ma'am. So the number of qubits created uh, by India and compared with other countries hmm. were less. So is this because of the lack in technology or people who are uh, whose knowledge in quantum technology or quantum computing is less? Why is it like that? Yeah. Because uh, as a physics graduate, we mm. are exposed to quantum mechanics in in masters only. Yeah. During bachelors and all, we are not studying quantum mechanics. We are only studying classical mechanics. So, uh, so to start a career in quantum computing, uh, there's no uh, straight pathway. We have to uh, either go into IT sector or we have to go into physics and do masters and then PhD. So is this the... So these are two separate questions. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So the first one is why do we have a few qubits as opposed to other countries? So just to put this in perspective, uh, you know, IBM did not start its journey uh, yesterday. So, you know, IBM has the largest number of qubits right now. So since 1990s, these countries have been investing in quantum, whether it's USA, whether it's China, some other countries. So with a lot of concerted investment and belief that this will happen, it has now happened several decades down the line. So, and, and of course, we cannot say that because they lacked in knowledge or whatever. It's just a hard problem. Uh, quantum computers are not easy to make. So lots of challenges have been solved, and now, as a community, we are somewhere. Having said that, in India, a lot of the work that we have done traditionally has been in the theoretical domain. Only, let's say, for the last 10, 15 years, we have had some kind of funding for some projects in quantum. Finally, we have a national mission with a promise of larger resources. So uh, it's the Indian students outside who actually make these things, by the way. So India, there is no problem with our understanding or our intelligence. I mean, you know, we probably are one of the more intelligent uh, species uh, in terms of country. But it's just that, you know, we need to have the right resources available. So we have started very recently. So naturally, we are not, uh, com uh, it's not fair to say that we, uh, we should be competing already uh, with the 1,000 qubit. 
But then of course now we have the thing set, we should reach there soon enough. And that is why we have the national mission with the focus towards that, right? So you cannot do something, so one thing you have to understand is because somebody has done something taking 30 years doesn't mean that you will be able to do it in a day because they have done it. You have to go through some uh, capacity building as well, maybe a shorter one because some information is available. But still, you have to, you cannot write a novel without learning the alphabet and constructing sentences. So this is uh, not, uh, not at all surprising. The second question is, I do not understand why you did not have quantum mechanics in bachelors, because I, of course, did. So maybe there is some disparity between how physics is being done and so, uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, we had at least one or two courses in BSc physics honors uh, for quantum. Uh, but then if you want a career in quantum, you need not do it uh, through a, a physics uh, thing per se. So just to take an example of the satellite QKD project, we actually have engineers who are working with us. We also have astrophysicists working with us. I, I think um, Annapurni left because she was not feeling very well, but then, you know, she's from Indian Institute of Astrophysics. In fact, one of their former PhD students is a postdoc with me. So there are different kinds of uh, expertise that is required to make a project like this succeed. So there is control systems, there is uh, electronics and communications engineering, there is astrophysics, there is hardcore math, information theory, and of course, quantum physics. So you need not be an expert in all of them to contribute. So of course, it's a team effort. So uh, depends on really what excites you. Uh, you can do engineering, you can do, you know, uh, different kinds of engineering or physics or mathematics because you can come up with the quantum algorithm which will break uh, factorization more easily, maybe. So, I mean, you know, it's not a, it's not a one, uh, one way uh, solution. So there are many pathways to a career in quantum, including industry, for instance, which is very open now to taking uh, young students and they sometimes go and you know do their degrees from a, uh, an institute while being in the industry and then come back with that knowledge. So there is a lot of that happening. We can discuss more of course if you are interested but um, I hope that answers both the questions to a certain extent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Ma'am, uh, you said like the single photon was actually done, the experiment was done. Can you... Sorry, can you repeat sing the single, single photon, photon experiment? Yeah. So how it is related to the quantum uh, cryptography, how it is related and yeah. also uh, how it is more used, like uh, can you that just repeat the satellite experiment, what you told? Mm. No, that's a good question. So what does a single photon do in quantum cryptography? Mm. A single photon, uh, you know, uh, of course has some property. Let's say polarization is one property. So it can be a horizontally polarized photon or a vertically polarized photon. In other words, it could be an on state or an off state, just to make it simpler. So what we do is we call one of these states one and the other zero. So the bit of information that you're trying to send is encoded in this property of the single photon. So each single photon represents one bit of information. So you have thousand bits, thousand photons carrying one, 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 one bit. That gives you the bit string which is what you do in key distribution. So it's a, it's a string of bits which forms the key. So a single photon with its unique property, which could be polarization, actually gives you that one bit of information. And having said that, uh, satellite is what, so basically we are going to send up these streams of photons, in our case entangled photons, but that's a detail. So these photons will carry these bits of information and then it will reach the satellite. Satellite will store that, Okay, and then it will go and do something similar with another ground station because we are doing uplink. So we are doing this from two different places at two different times. And so then uh, what, inf uh, what uh, operation the satellite will do is a little bit involved. But doing that, it will be able to encrypt one key by using the other key. So that way, both you and me in different locations on Earth will, sh will have one version of the secure key. So satellite acts as a trusted courier, as we call it essentially relaying the information from one ground station to the other, yeah. Any more? Right, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. To Urbasi. That was a very, very interesting talk. So we have come to the end of the session that we have planned today. And uh, I would uh, like to have a small open house uh, on feedback on how you've experienced this day-long session. I mean, it was curated, taking into consideration the significance of Women's Day, as well as bringing together some of the leading professionals of this field uh, in uh, science uh, and you know, the, the topics that we have gone through. All very interesting, and it's a very unique uh, forum that we have been able to create. 
So it's an open house. Anybody would like to speak or comment, uh, I can share the mic. Let me start by saying this was a fascinating day with outstanding talks. Uh, if you forget that they were given by women scientists, forget that. Just the science part was absolutely brilliant. And I thank all the speakers for having shared their thoughts and their uh, talks with us. Thank you so much, all of them. Thank you. I do agree that, yes, if we leave aside the women part, I think it was well articulated and well presented because it was women. <laughs> but anybody else would like to share? We have students, faculty, uh, different members of the audience. Anything you would like to say about today's program? It's indeed uh, very, very informative and uh, on top of it, uh, we came to, came to know across so many domains in science and technology, being in chemistry, you know, we hardly meet uh, so vibrant uh, uh, you know, fields in uh, you know, women who have pioneered in their own uh, fields. It's really encouraging and it's a really wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else, any of the students would like to speak? Hi, and uh, thank you very much for uh, really thank the organizers for uh, having invited us over. And uh, it was wonderful. And like uh, Professor Mishra actually mentioned, it is the science that we are actually celebrating. And uh, the icing on the cake is that it is by women. So thank you very much. and. Um, I wish all the young uh, students over here and everybody else a uh, very nice journey in their science and technology, right? Thank you. We hope to come for many more such programs in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, very engaging Saturday. <laughs> Though we all said, oh, Saturday, it's a holiday or whatever, but uh, it was very engaging. And I am an academician from the humanities. But uh, the things were so interesting and so much information I got that uh, it was really very nice. And I hope lots of our students will inspire to get this thing. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, so wonderful a uh, session. I couldn't attend the morning, but I did attend the afternoon. It was fascinating, not only because it was so enriching and so full of information and so inspiring, but more because it was uh, you know, done by women who we are very proud of, women who stand out not only as scientists, but as leaders of science. So we are really proud. Uh, we run an NGO, and many of our girls, as well as our teachers, our leaders of the NGO are here. Two of them are next to me. And uh, we are here to inspire our girls into science. So I think they'll take it back. Some of the girls were with me. They said, we're absolutely fascinated. We run a tech fest, and we try to see these are children from underprivileged homes who we train into uh, be the, you know, to go to university and across. And I think they absolutely were moved and inspired by each one of the speakers today and all the different fields. So thank you very much. It was wonderful. And I hope it's very, very important. We are 50% of the country. So the more we can do of this, the more we can inspire. We know that uh, you know, it's India will stand out, youth of India uh, will break all the barriers and take things forward. So thank you very much. And I'm sure it'll be wonderful if you can have many more like this and get many more students to come uh, because they need to hear you. They don't get a chance. So this is a wonderful, and maybe what you've just shared if you could send us the, uh, the details. Yeah, the recordings. We'll share it with hundreds of more students uh, who can actually benefit from your learnings. Thank you. I, I think I would like to say that uh, uh, it was... Um, thank you so much for uh, all the people who, have, who are here. And uh, uh, I, uh, I would like to thank all women and uh, at the same time, you know, people who have attended uh, men exclusively because uh, so many people have this in mind that, oh, it's a Women's Day celebration, we are not supposed to come. 
and if you have come forward and attended that means uh, that it's a great thing that you are giving uh, you know equal opportunity you believe in it so i would like to double thank you for that <laughs> so that's uh, and uh, all the sessions were wonderful and uh, uh, it was a great learning for me um, uh, uh, definitely because uh, nobody gets exposure to know everything because we ha we kind of are caught up in our uh, uh, watertight compartments right and we try to see things in a minute level and when we come to some events like this we get to know more things and our knowledge expands a lot and this also gives opportunity to collaborate and work with other people and uh, i think this is a very good opportunity for uh, students faculty and of course uh, professors uh, researchers and technologists thank you so much thank you for conducting this event i would like to really thank that it was a great session and very well thought okay thanks request uh, professor mishra to come on the stage we would like to present the mementos to the speakers so i call upon uh, hemalata barra thank you so much uh, next i call upon dr anita krishnan Professor Urbazihi Sinha. Uh, can you say, say this? Uh, Sheila to give the final concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, I will not keep this long. We started the day by saying, uh, with uh, a quote from Dr. Kang, which is that, what you don't see, you cannot become. Today, what we saw was some outstanding scientists. And uh, hopefully, and I really believe all of us have been inspired to, uh, to uh, take that up and say, look, we can do uh, what every one of these women has achieved. Uh, it, for us, as the folks that organized this, we ourselves wanted to enjoy uh, the, the whole uh, day. And I think we've learned a lot and certainly enjoyed every one of the, the, the talks. Uh, I think there were a few key things that came out, few key messages that came out. One, again, about uh, the fact that science as it is growing is becoming more and more cross-functional, more and more interdisciplinary, more and more global, and we do need to embrace that as our primary way of thinking. The second thing is that there's so much happening in India. You know, when I graduated from IIT, the normal thing to do was to do the GRE and go abroad. That, that's what everybody did. And, um, uh, so, but today you, you don't need to think that way because there's just so much happening here and it is perfectly possible to achieve what you want, achieve your dreams, staying right here in India. And uh, the last thing that I want to say is that uh, in, as we move forward, it is, uh, this again comes back from the very first talk, uh, Dr. Pra Prapreet, which is that we need to take care of ourselves first and foremost. Uh, I think that's a very, very important message. And learning is a very important part of taking care of ourselves. Today, what we've been exposed to is just so much of learning. And finally, I just want to thank every one of our speakers because they've given wholeheartedly. They've shared so much with us uh, in a manner without holding back anything. And I just want to say a big, big, big thank you to all of them. And of course, thanks to everyone for being here.